Um, I believe that in order to be a nation of the gospel, that Jesus Christ Thank died for our goodness. sins, and this is all in accordance with 1 Corinthians 15, that he died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised from the dead, and after that he appeared. Um, then we know, of course, he ascended into heaven. The proclamation then of that, uh, is a call for us to repent of our sin, to have a change of mind in such a way that we turn from our sin and we turn toward God in faith in Jesus Christ, that he is who he said he is, that he did what he uh, said that he would do, that he is went to the cross and there he made propitiation for our sin. And that if we trust in him, then we are born from above. We are born from above if we trust in Jesus. Those who are not born from above do not trust in Jesus or born again do not trust in Jesus. It's a work of God's grace. It's a supernatural act, and then the Holy Spirit in that act indwells the, the believer. Um, now, tongues are said, if you want to get in, into a discussion on that, which is not in our times up here, but I'll finish my, my answer. Uh, I do not believe that tongues are a necessary evidence of salvation. There is a dispute among uh, saved, genuine, born-again Christians on uh, the spiritual gifts. Uh, but Paul, I would argue, is clear in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14 that not everyone speaks in tongues. He says that specifically. So to argue it's necessary for salvation or a necessary evidence is false. All right, Mark, we'll be moving on now to uh, your five-minute rebuttal. And are you ready? Uh, yeah, go ahead, Justin. And begin. Okay. Now, uh, I'm going to my uh, uh, Mark uh, chapter 16 here, uh, and I'm going to read the last part of it. And I want to uh, wanna ex uh, use this to help kind of uh, in my view, Justin takes a completely different view of, uh, of why Jesus came and why the Bible even says that he sent the comforter, you know, and it fell down upon the, the apostles there in Acts, you know. Then we had the Great Commission. So I want to read this right here, and this is what he said. Okay. And afterwards he appeared unto the eleven, and, and as they sat and ate me, uh, and abrided, unbrided with them and their unbelief. That means he reproved them. And the hardness of the heart, because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. Okay? And he said unto them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So you got to preach the truth first. And that's repentance from dead words. Okay? And faith towards God. So, all right? So that means you got to reprove sin. And he that believeth. Okay? So next, the next step to the gospel is you've got to believe. And that means you got to believe in the cause. You mean you got to believe in that. If someone was to approach you and say, repent, you know, you got to say, okay, I'm willing to go to your your supernatural rehab. Okay? So that's the next step of the gospel, okay? Baptized. All right? But he that believes it is damned. That means if you deny the baptism of the Holy Ghost and the evidence of tongues, you will be damned. So you'll come preaching a false gospel. So there's a stipulation there. And it says, and, these, and then it says, and these signs shall follow them, and my name shall they cast out devils. That means you're going to be in five-fold ministry. They shall speak with new tongues, okay? That's the Holy Ghost language. They shall take up serpents, and if they shall drink of anything that shall not hurt them, they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So, and, and also, too, you know, I believe the gospel is the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost in the kingdom. God empowered us so we can go out and help deliver people from sin although justin is my friend he is preaching something that says you can live a certain way and still get into heaven so that is that given the bible says don't use grace for a life and sin so it's okay if i go out there and i get drunk commit adultery on my wife and all that stuff i gonna go to hell you know and, and if i believe on jesus the bible says you can believe upon the name of, of jesus even demon believe but if you don't honor him with your ways and your heart and live for him, take your cross up daily, that is a false salvation that you never have. So some people can preach and never have uh, have that taste of the heavenly gift. And so, yeah, when you go and preach Hebrews chapter 6, if they have not had the baptism of the Holy Spirit, they do not work and drink, they never was entered into the kingdom to begin with. So they never was 
They never was there, see? But then it also says if you've been enlightened, you can fall away. And there are many, many, many examples of that throughout the earth. So, you know, just like, if, and I take the view that Jesus is the son of God, not God. Me and Justin disagree on that. So, yeah, so it's very easy for me to deny, if I believe believe that view, to deny all the things in the Old Testament. Deny dreams, deny visions, you know, and stuff like that. So to me, it's a false version of the gospel. It's not true, plain and simple. God, Jesus, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then even in um, in uh, uh, John chapter 3, it says you got to be born in the Spirit and of the water to enter into the kingdom of heaven. So in order in order to be initiated in the faith, and this is all throughout the Bible, even when uh, Saul became Paul, he went baptized and talked with tongues, you know. So he was he was had the Holy Ghost. And yeah, you know, then there's the interpretation of tongues. That's just when you know somebody else is what they're speaking, you know. So you, you gotta you gotta have a correct view of the gospel. Or it was a false it was a false uh, repentance and you was never brought into the faith uh to begin with, so therefore you, the view would be all uh, kind of messed up. So, but that's the gospel. You know, you supposed to go out and reprove sin. Why do we need a savior for? I mean, why did he come to the world to save us from what sin? And, and save us every day. Every day, I need a miracle in my life. Faith coming. You know, you gotta have faith to speak to you, into your area of your of your life and say, "Help me, God." Then you gotta believe. So, and believing is knowing. That comes with trials and tribulations. You know, go ahead, Dustin. Hi, here. All right. Now, Mark, I have uh, five minutes to cross-examine you. Are you ready? Okay. Yes, sir. All right, Mark. Um... You said that the gospel is the reproving of sin. If we go to 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 15, verses 1 through 4, uh, we have a definition of the gospel of salvation by the Apostle Paul. He says, beginning in verse 1, I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, and which also you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. I deliver to you as of first importance that what I also received. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Would you agree that the gospel of salvation is that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, was buried, and raised from the dead? Justin, uh, you said First Corinthians what? 15, particular 3 and 4, but 1 through 4. All right, 15. Let me get there. Are the three elements of the gospel that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day? Yes or no? Well, Justin says the gospel. I come to you, uh, a gospel, preaching the gospel. So in other words, a cause. You know, what is the gospel? Repentance from, from dead works. Okay, so you got to stand with that. And Where then you, you are saved by the gospel. Huh? Where do you find that in the text? I, I, I don't want well, to... Well, uh, Justin, in verse, in verse 1. Moreover, brother, I declare unto you the gospel. Okay, he's preaching the gospel. Repentance, you know, gospel is... Uh, you know, repent. Go, go back to God. Reconcile. That's the gospel. Okay, I preach to you, which have, which have you also received? Notice you've got to receive it, and wherewith you stand. I mean, you got to stand with it. Okay. Verses, so, and by which you also four, huh? Do, do verses three through four. Well, just not, not skip us around in the whole Bible and make it say something that it's not going to say. If I'm going to read, I'm going to read in context. I didn't skip. But I'm asking I, you, do verses I, I, 3 and 4 I, I'm not going give the... It because it's explaining the process, Justin. The whole process verse, is what you got to bring out. Verse so 3 and 4. Okay, now... All right. Uh, by which also you are saved, you keep in the memorial. So you keep it. And I have preached unto you, unless you believe in vain. So you cannot believe what he's preaching. For I delivered you first of all which... You, I have received and how Christ died for your sins. So he, he's preached that to gospel. Repentance from dead words. You're leaving that out. Mark, what are you going to repent let's, by? Let's move, let's move forward then, Mark. Um, are we okay. saved by Jesus or are we saved by what we do? 
Well, Justin, just because I go down to the altar and I say a five minute prayer, don't mean my heart's right. I got to be saved from something. I got to be delivered from something. What am I going to the altar for? I got to be saved from something. You know, and then I got to give him permission and have a mind like Christ. So, I mean, I got to be saved. Can you give me? Can you give me a yes or no to this question? Are we fully and totally saved on the basis of Jesus Christ, his righteous life, his death upon the cross, burial and resurrection, his ascension and his eternal reign as our Lord and God? Yes or no? Justin, there's a group of people that honor him with his lips, but their heart is far from him. No, you cannot go confess a, a something with your mouth and be and, and be saved. It's not, that's a false gospel. There's no such thing as me going down. Are we saved by Jesus Christ alone? Yes or no? We are called when we call upon the name of Jesus, Justin. No. No. The answer, if you want me to answer a straight up question, it's really hard to do that. The answer is no, we are not saved just because Jesus came to the world. If that was true, what was the first purpose of the, the world for? He came to, to so when you, the world. Mark, when you stand before God, then are you saying you believe that you are going to be allowed into heaven on the basis of what you have done? Yes or no? Justin, was, if that was true, once Jesus come to the earth, Justin, we all should have went to heaven and should have been wrapped up. If that was true, just because Jesus did what he did, we all should be in heaven. There's no such thing as hell. Then Mark, let's look, at Ephesians, let's look at Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. There, okay. Paul says, For by grace you have been saved, past tense, through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Do you agree with the words of the Apostle Paul here where he says that you've been saved by grace through faith, that it's not of yourselves, that it's the gift of God, and that it's not as a result of works? And my time's up. If you can answer the question. Well, okay, Justin, I'm going to read verse 10. For a I, week I, asked about, I asked ready. about 8 and 9, Mark. What are you leaving out the Bible? Well, I can't. I just That's can't leave out half the Bible. The Bible says not to do that. Don't add and remove things. I can't read one verse without reading the rest of it. I'm leaving out the whole thing to make point my my view, Justin. I, I believe the rules of cross examination are that you're to answer the question. Well, I'm trying to answer it, and, and the answer is in the next verse. You know, Jesus called us into good works. You know, so and we should walk in them. There's a reason why he's saying that. He wants us to walk in good work. So when we do that, we are saved through faith and grace. But don't forget about the works part. All right, Mark, it's time for your uh, five minute uh, rebuttal. Or no, let's see. I did a rebuttal and then cross exam. You did. Now it's time for closings. Okay, go ahead. All right, so it'll be my five minute close. All right. All right. Here we go. Justin, why don't you take a little bit longer, maybe like eight minutes. Can you do that? That give you a little bit more you time. Want, you want us to do eight minute closes? Yeah, give you a little bit more time because I believe I believe we touched on a lot of stuff here, Justin. Okay. Do eight it. minute closes. I'll agree to that. Here we go. Okay. All right, we talked about a lot of things throughout our debate and really only scratched the surface, not really be able to jump in as much as we would uh, uh, like to, and I'm sure Mark would say the same thing. But again, I want to uh, point out that um, all that Scripture talks about as to what is the good news revolves around the rescue of sinners from the wrath of God for their sin. And uh, the promise of good news uh, of one who will come and accomplish that rescue is given us in Genesis chapter 3, beginning in verse 15, where we hear about the seed of the woman who is going to come and be this rescuer. We trace, by the way, that lineage throughout all of Scripture while we're looking for this promised child. That's what the entire Old Testament is about, is the lineage of this promised child who is going to come. And this child comes, and that child is Jesus Christ. Now, I want to point out that the issue of whether or not Jesus is fully God and fully man comes into play here absolutely. Because if Jesus is the one who is to rescue us, he goes to the cross and lays down his life for our sin. If he is anything less than God, he is an insufficient Savior. And so who he is is absolutely essential. That's why he is Emmanuel, 
God with us. And Mark denies that. And on that basis, Mark is teaching a false gospel alone. Then we get into the issues of what is this gospel? Well, Paul defines the historical elements of that gospel in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 when we go there and we look at verses 1 through 4. He says he's going to declare for us the gospel that he was preaching. What are the elements of that gospel? They're given in verses 3 to 4. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, like as in Isaiah 53, which it says that the iniquities of us all are going to be laid upon him, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Now, that is the historical elements. Then we come into how you tie that in to the sinner and how that applies to the sinner. And the call in Scripture is to repent and to put your complete trust in Jesus because Jesus is the one who saves us. That's what the entire book of Romans is about. And uh, again, we looked at justification. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. How are we justified? We are justified by faith. And it is by faith that we have peace with God. Unbelievers do not have peace with God. Unbelievers are at enmity with God. Unbelievers are under the wrath of God. And so we come out from under that wrath by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ. At which point we are justified, declared right before God. And that justification is such that it is an an unbroken chain in Romans 8 where we saw very clearly, number one in verse one, that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And then secondly, as we come to verse 29, we read, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become for conformed to the image of a son so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. That is the importance of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Justification by faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. And Mark denies that. We looked at scriptures that are absolutely replete that we are saved by grace. And the point being is that if we are saved by God alone, by his grace, then God will absolutely keep us because that salvation is a perfect salvation. I would ask anyone who disagrees to answer this question. What has God ever failed at? Nothing. And if God is the one who saves us, are you going to say that God is going to fail at saving his people? Perish that thought. Scripture says specifically that God will not lose those whom are his sheep. Whenever we come to John chapter 6, again, and Mark would not deal with these passages in a way that was relevant, he says this, and let's just start in verse 37. Jesus speaking, all that the Father gives me will come to me. They will. It's a certainty. And the one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out. I've come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me. This is God's will for the Son. That of all that he has given me, I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. The ones that the Father gave him, Jesus isn't going to lose them. He's going to raise them up to eternal life on the last day. Verse 40, for this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him, or is believing in him, will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on the last day. Now, we didn't get to get into this much in the debate. Mark continually accuses me of saying that uh, a person who is saved can just go out and live like hell, and it's going to be fine, or whatever. And that is absolutely false. That's not what the gospel says. The gospel says that those who are born again and who are justified, that that is going to be evidence to their life because they have been made a new creation in Jesus Christ. They're no longer going to live as sinners because they are now saints. They have a new nature. Not that they are perfect, not that they never, ever sin, but when we sin, we confess it. We repent, but we don't live lives characterized by sin, and if we do, we should call our salvation into question. That is why I did not affirm once saved, always saved, because that is a term that is thrown around and is really baloney. 
What I believe in is that God preserves those who are his. When he saves someone, he keeps them, and they, as a result of that preservation, will persevere in their faith, that they will live a life that absolutely characterizes the fact that they are saved. Romans 6.1, Paul, knowing that he's teaching the gospel of grace alone through faith alone, Christ alone, answers Mark's objection. Romans 6 1. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. God forbid it. How shall we who die to sin still live in it? And that's the gospel. We do die to sin. And if we're dead to sin, how can we continue to live in sin? We can not. And so salvation is by grace alone, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in the Lord Jesus Christ alone. Then we come to verse 10. Mark wouldn't deal with verses 8 and 9. He wanted to go to verse 10. Verse 10 teaches that those who have been saved by grace, it is foreordained by God that they will walk in good works. So those who claim to have faith in Christ and do not walk in good works give evidence that they are not saved by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ. A true gospel presentation is a call to repentance of sin. It is a call to put your trust in Jesus Christ. But a false gospel presentation teaches that one is saved by works. And I'm afraid that's what I'm hearing from Mark. Not only that, he has a false Christ who cannot save you. And I call on him to repent of these false teachings. So to conclude, I affirm that a genuine Christian who is truly born again cannot fully and finally fall away from their salvation. Okay, just to give me like five minutes, I'm going to walk over to the bathroom. I'll be right back, okay? Give me, give me five, five seconds. All right, we're going to take a break. Okay. Go take a break from me. I'm going to use bathroom. All right. Yeah, we uh, appreciate everyone watching. I'm not going to make any comments or anything toward my position or against Mark's during this time. I'm uh, going to be fair. Uh, but uh, we do appreciate everyone uh, who's watching and taking time out of your day to take a look at this subject. Again, it, it is a deep subject and one that you can't cover in uh, such a short amount of time in the way that is needed. But at least, you know, we are engaging in conversation. And uh, there are people who are on both sides of the issue who are watching and some of the other issues that we've been discussing. And, uh, you know, it's a good way to hear different points of view and to make up uh, your mind uh, according to the scriptures. So, Mark, are you back? Yes, sir. I'm ready. All right. I was just telling them I wasn't saying anything for my position or against yours. I was just thanking them for watching. I wanted to be fair. Okay, Justin. All right, Mark, you got eight minutes. Are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready, buddy. Here you go. Go ahead. Okay. Now, to me, what it seems like what Justin is, is saying, which I totally disagree with, is he's saying that you can go down to the altar and you can say a, a – Jesus coming in my heart, and, and then you can leave that place without no change, and you're still going to enter into heaven. And to me, that is not true, okay? It don't work that way. You've got to live a certain way in order to grow and become a believer. Because let me tell you something. If you're going to go down there and you're going to repent, you're going to want to live for God. Therefore, you're going to have faith in Jesus that he's going to lead you to God. Now, my view of the gospel is totally, totally different than uh, Justin's. I believe the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, and, uh, and also two and angels and things like that. So Justin takes a, a, a different view. Uh, he believes Jesus is God and all, they're all equal, you know. So uh, I, I completely disagree with that. So I can definitely understand when I take that view where he's coming from. But now if Justin's point of view was, was true, then when Jesus came to the earth, uh, we should have wrapped all things up. We should not give account for none of our works. We should all go straight to heaven without a hell. So, and uh, I, I don't think Justin really believes that that way. I think he, I, I see him live in a certain way, and I see he's a very clean person. So evidently, he believes and you've got to live a certain way. So what we're disagreeing on is how we live and what we need to do to keep our salvation. Because I believe that you can lose your salvation, and it clearly states there in Hebrews chapter 6, that, but it also says those that were 
were once enlightened. And I understand that because about five years ago, on a side of a bathtub, I was right in the middle of going through a separation. And somebody come in, they laid hands on me like the Bible says in Mark chapter 16. And they said, and they prophesied, gifts of the Holy Ghost, to turn from your wicked ways, Mark, I'm going to fix it. Well, I had to get up and walk from that bathtub to um, that bed, bed to the master bathtub, and I had to repent in my heart. And then when I, when it was, a, I had to change the way that I was going to live. I had to make that decision. And when you make that decision, you're going to walk in it. And right there on the side of the bathtub, I received that Rakanda Bulashata, the evidence of the Holy Ghost with tongue. And also, too, I had a demon that left me that was leading me down that wrong path. So I don't, I don't, like the Bible says, those that don't believe will be damned. So I'm going to believe in the Holy Ghost. And that's what he does for us. And the Bible says, you walk in the spirit, you will not feel the lust of the flesh. So I believe we got to grow. So my view of the gospel is different than Justin's. Way, way, completely opposite. I believe in the kingdom. Okay, the Bible says the gospel of this kingdom. So when Jesus did what he did at the cross, he did away with the old law. That means he became our sacrifice. And when the Bible says those that believe on the name of Jesus, they believe he's a high priest and our ultimate sacrifice. So I'm kingdom minded. So when you understand the gospel that way that Jesus came to reconcile us back to God, then you understand we got to go back to what? We got to go back to living the way God designed us to live. And just like my good friend the other day was saying on the, on, on the video, that there was the Pharisees were adding things to the law. So we got to go back to Moses' moral law. So we got to live the way that God, when he written down that law and taught, began to teach to Adam and them, that's our guideline, the way we need to live. Now, we don't sacrifice no more because God got rid of the manipulation in the gospel. See, we got to go back to God. So therefore, when we do that, we are going to have eternal life. And notice it says, those that bleed. So when you live the way that you need to live, you're going to have salvation. But there are times the Bible says, blessed are those that hear what the voice of the Spirit saying. There are times when you can dash your foot against a stone and hinders God present in your life. So you can you can backslide, plain and simple. Just because I go down there and I and I say an unhearted five minute prayer before some preacher that don't need ain't anointed don't need to be preaching up there to begin with, and I say Jesus come into my heart and I'm saved. I can go out and get drunk. I can go out and sleep with prostitutes. I can go out and do drugs, and I have no fruits. You know that's completely contrary to the word of God. He said you will know them by their fruits. So they never was they never was in the kingdom. To begin with. So, and that's what the Bible says about wolves in sheep's clothing. So, that, that's my that's my uh, complete uh, view of, of what the Bible says to do. And it's true relationship, you know. Uh, we got to be a have a walk and talk to relationship with God so he can tell us what to do. And he's got to be our high priest. Just like he appeared to uh, uh, Saul and there on the road to Damascus, he became Paul. He, he, God, he, God was there and talking to all the disciples. He'll talk to you too. Jesus will come down and talk to you and clear you, clean you up so you can go before the Father. And you ain't got to go to the temple no more. You fall down and you repent from your dead works. And there, therefore, this right here continues to save you from your old life. Like it says there in Luke, you become a new man. But let me tell you something. You can... I can walk pick up right now and I can deny Christ and I can trash the Holy Ghost and I can I can walk away and lose my salvation. See, I, but I believe in hell. I believe there's consequences. In them. And and even in the book of Revelation, it talks about the wrath of God. The wrath of God for what? You know, there's a such thing as punishment. There's a such thing as going going through things, you know, and we, we got to we got to turn back to God. You know, through Christ Jesus, you know, and live the way we need to live. Don't kill, don't steal, you know. With all the what the Bible says. That's all the time I need, Justin, from my rebuttal. So go ahead, we do the answer. Okay. Um that will uh, then conclude the debate. Mark, you had a minute twenty left. Um, okay. Uh take your time there, Justin. I want you to go through and, and I want you to look at you wanna answer some of these questions? Yeah, we can uh look at some questions. Um you, there was you three things I was, 
I have, I don't have very long. I really don't. I got to go work soon. But uh, maybe can I, can I, can we discuss uh, a couple of things that you, that you brought up uh, maybe just for a few minutes? I think everybody watching, I've seen them ask questions about it. One of them is tongues. Can we talk about that that is being Listen, evidence of salvation? Let's do this right here. You you take my few minutes I had and you re, you rebuttal and then we we'll end it, okay? I'm not gonna rebuttal after that. You go ahead and do the closing, okay? And go ahead and okay, rebuttal. Yeah. And I'm not gonna I'm not gonna do nothing after that. We'll just end it from here and and then we'll we'll there's always we have time for another discussion, brother. Yeah, okay, we can have another discussion, sure. Um, yeah, I've seen as I was looking through the uh, comments, I saw uh, people who you know were agreeing with this and that uh, on both sides. And, uh, you know, so that's uh, good. we got people who are watching. Um, but, you know, l- let me say, number one, I believe that Jesus Christ is our high priest. He, that's the, that's, he's our mediator between us and the Father. And uh, as a matter of fact, I would have argued if I could, again, there's so much, but if I could have touched on that, that, you know, if Jesus is the high priest for his people and he's mediating between them, uh, you know, if you're going to 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 argue uh, the view that you're having. Justin, can I ask you a question? Will you touch on it? Let me ask you a question. I want you to. I want you to uh, what about the, uh, the lamps of the seven virgins? Uh, you know, their lamp ran out and they was they was left behind. What do you do with that? Uh, touch on that, too, if you would, while you're in your clothing. OK. Um, wow, he had a lot, of, a lot of stuff here. Okay, let me just say this. If you're saying that a person can lose their salvation, and you're arguing that Jesus is the mediator, the high priest for that person, then what you're saying is that Jesus can fail as high priest. You're saying that he is unable to mediate in such a way as to save the one for whom he's mediating. You're saying that Jesus... There's times when Jesus just, he, he fails as high priest. And I find that absolutely unacceptable because Jesus is a perfect high priest and he does not fail in his intercession. And I think that that is one of those things I would say we need to be very careful when we start saying Jesus is failing as high priest. The other thing that I wanted to touch on is tongues. Um, you are arguing that uh, tongues are an evidence of salvation. And I'm going to um, assume that you're saying that because of Acts chapter 2, uh, in which on the day of Pentecost, we see that the early church began to speak in tongues. And this is whenever the Holy Spirit came upon them. Um, however, I would argue that what you see in Acts 2 is a different type of tongues than is spoken of in 1 Corinthians. And I know there's going to be some people even on my side who are going to disagree maybe with a little bit of what I'm going to say. Um, but, but let me say this. If you come over to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and you come down to verse number 27, and here the apostle, of course, is talking to the church there in Corinth, and he says, you, now you are Christ's body and individually members of it. And God is appointed in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, miracles, gifts of healings, helps, administrations, various kinds of tongues. All are not apostles, are they? All are not prophets, are they? All are not teachers, are they? All are not workers of miracles, are they? All do not have gifts of healings, do they? All do not speak with tongues, do they? All do not interpret, do they? But earnestly desire the greater gifts. I do not see how it can be any more clear that Paul says not everyone in the body of Christ speaks with tongues. He says all do not speak with tongues. Verse 30, all do not speak with tongues. He's saying, is everyone in the body of Christ an apostle? No. Is everyone in the body of Christ have the gift of healing? No. Does everyone in the body of Christ speak with tongues? No. That's what he says. It is scripture. Unless you want to argue with that passage of scripture, all do not speak in tongues. And, and so there are a lot of people who teach this. They say, well, if you're truly saved, you have to speak in tongues. And and I will say this. This comes to, to, to people a lot of times. They say the spiritual gifts have disappeared. Well, if you read over there in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, uh, verse number 39, it says, Therefore, my brethren, desire earnestly to prophesy, 
listen, and do not forbid to speak in tongues. Do not forbid it. So, wherever you stand on this issue, if if one believes that these gifts are in operation in any sense today, here are two things that we know from Corinthians about it. Number one, not everybody who is saved speaks in tongues. And number two, if someone believes that they speak in tongues, and it's, it, you know, you could go through all the channels, of local church, how you want to test this, whatever. But we're not supposed to forbid that if it's done within the order that's sanctioned in 1 Corinthians. And there are going to be people disagree with me on, on all sides of what I just said, but it is the text. That's what the text says. It says, do not forbid to speak in tongues, and the text says not everybody does it. Salvation is not based on our works, Mark. It is based on the work of Jesus. And to, to teach it's based on our works is to say that we're going to stand before God and glory before him and what we have done. And I think that that's a false gospel. Uh, so again, I mean, to, to argue that well, someone can lose their salvation because salvation is of God is to say that God can fail, that, you know, contrary to the scriptures we looked at, he will lose those there is sheep, that they will not have eternal life, that Jesus fails as a mediator, all of these things. I do believe that a Christian can fall into sin, but the, the evidence that he is a genuine Christian is going to be repentance. It's going to be repentance. But it doesn't mean that he's going to fully and finally fall away. And that's the difference, because God keeps those that are his. Uh, and I would go into the lamps thing, but I mean, I'd be adding so, some more stuff in. But essentially, I would say that they were those who were not prepared. They were those who were not genuine. The ones who were genuine were the ones that the Father uh, knew. They would be the ones that the Father had in his hand. The others would not be. Uh, and we'd have to look at the context of that and, and flush all that out. Um, but those would be some of the comments I would have. I also, I also want to say, please don't misunderstand what I'm saying. Because we are saved by grace through faith, I'm not saying that therefore we can go out and live however we want to live. Scripture denies that. As a matter of fact, it says if you go out and you're a drunkard, 1 Corinthians 6, 9, 10, you go out and you're a drunkard, you're an adulterer, uh, you're covetous, and your life is characterized by that, it gives evidence you're not truly saved. You're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. If someone comes along preaching that you can do those things and be saved, that's false. And that's why I do not like the term once saved, always saved. Because it gives the impression that if you went down to an altar and prayed a prayer one time when you were little, and then you go out and live your whole life as a drunk, you're still going to go to heaven. And scripture says that is not true. It's not true that the drunkard will inherit the kingdom of heaven. That's a lie. So my argument is that Genuine salvation is by grace through faith, and that results in a, a breaking those strangleholds of sin. So if one is a drunkard, verse 11, he's justified, he's washed, he's cleansed, such that he no longer walks in a life characterized by drunkenness. And, and so please, please don't misrepresent what I'm saying. I, I heard you misrepresent me a couple of times, and we are friends and, and everything. I'm not trying to, to bash you, but I'm just asking you, please hear what I'm saying. And don't accuse me of teaching something that I'm not. I am teaching that genuine salvation will produce a life lived in obedience to God. I am not teaching that salvation by grace means that we now have a license to sin. That's false. Okay, Justin. Uh, so it sounds like you're changing your view. That was the view that I had from the beginning of the debate. So let me let me get this straight. So you believe if you go down to an altar and you repent and then you grow in God and you keep growing and keep having a personal relationship with him, then your salvation is guaranteed. Right? If you are truly saved, you're going to continue to grow in God, yes. Uh, it doesn't mean that you have a life of perfection. That's why sanctification is important. We continually grow with the Lord. But we are going to be a creation that is changed by Christ such that we now uh, live a new life uh, in which we are not enslaved any longer to sin, but we are enslaved now to Christ. There will be okay, a lot difference that, in the life Justin. of the Christian. I agree with everything you just said, but what we're talking about, if you go down to the altar and you repent, Justin, and then you grow, and then you say in the middle of your walk that you're going to turn away from God, does that still mean you're going to go to heaven if you turn? My, my argument is that those who, who turn, as John says, uh, they went out from us because they were not of us. 
So one who turns away, like we looked at Hebrews, and if there was a person who was in that congregation who turned back to Judaism away from Jesus Christ, then what that gives evidence of is that they were one of the tares among the wheat. We didn't even get to look at that parable. Uh, but tares and wheat were identical. And whenever they were growing up, you didn't know which was which until over time it demonstrated what it was. One who turns away is one who is a tare, one who is not wheat, and they will be cast into the fire because they went out from us because they were not of us. So that's that's what I would define as an apostate, one who is surrounded by the things of God, uh, one who gives a profession with the mouth about Jesus Christ, but they are not genuinely his. They are merely sinners parading around as Christians, and in time, uh, the truth may uh, come out. There are some, I believe, who may die, and you know we won't know that until eternity. And they'll be in hell, and we'll we'll think, well, that person must be in heaven, but in reality, they weren't his. Uh, you know, that's very possible. Okay. Well, that that what you're saying, I, I agree with you, Justin. Um, that's what I'm trying to quote there in Hebrews. Those that you know that came and wanted wanted that stuff, and they fell away. So it sounds like to me you're you're saying people can lose their salvation. But if you're, saying, you're going back and what you're doing, what you're doing, Justin, mm -hmm. you're going back and what you're saying is you're saying from the get go they had a false view anyway to begin with. Therefore, they never was in the kingdom, and that's the same thing that I'm saying, Justin. You know, you got to be born in the water, born in the spirit, and you got to be uh, believe on God first. That's what I, that's me, what I'm saying. Let me let me give you an example of of what I'm saying to kind of clarify. And I, I have to go here in a minute, Mark. I really do. Okay. Um, in John chapter 12, um, Jesus is uh, preaching. He's doing miracles. Um, many rejected him. But you come to verse 42 of John 12. It says, Nevertheless, many even of the rulers believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, they were not confessing him for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue. For they love the approval of men rather than the approval of God. Now it says here that they believed in him, but it was a belief that was with their mind. It was a belief that was such that they did not confess Jesus. It was a belief such that it was so strong that they still had the fear of men rather than the fear of God. That is a false faith. They acknowledged it with their mind. And that is what I'm saying. There's a difference between what is called essentia and what is called fiducia. Essentia is here. You assent to facts with the mind. You acknowledge. Maybe even such that you're in a congregation. Like in the local church, you may have someone who says, I'm a Christian, I believe in Jesus, he died on the cross, etc. But... It's not a God-wrought, Holy Spirit faith in the heart of the person, in the inner man in which they fully have put their trust, not about Jesus, but in Jesus himself personally. And therefore, they are in the congregation. They appear to be a Christian. They appear uh, to have that profession. But in time, it is shown that that faith was only here, and it was never here. That's the difference. Those are those okay, who fall away. That's why the proposition is, can a person who is a genuine, born-again Christian fully and finally fall away from the faith? And the answer is no. Okay. Justin, I agree with you on, on that one point about if you never was a Christian to begin with, yes, that you don't classify in this group. But also, too, I, I, I'm saying there is a works level that's going to, but the Bible says, mighty or least in the kingdom. Your righteousness does not exceed the righteousness of God. The virtue, you shall not, you know, enter. And it's in this says in Hebrew, you can fall away. So I do believe that there are people that go to church and truly repent, and they do, they do fall away. They run because Mark, they're led away by have, sin. So have you, I, have I you ever fell away? Points. Mark, have uh, you ever fell away? Have you ever fell away? Have I sinned? Have you ever fell away? Well, one time when I very first became a Christian, Justin, I was dealing with a landlord. And I had went through the process, got the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and started reading the Bible. But then that landlord come down, and I was trying to live a Christian lifestyle, come down and just pestered me. So I went out there in the field, and I went out there and was going to box him. 
And I went out there and I, I, I said that prayer and I wanted to, and, you know, I had the Holy Ghost, but, you know, uh, I was led of, of the world. So therefore, I went out there and I, I, I cursed at him and things like that, you know, and I said, I'm going to stomp you, da, da, da. But I was a Christian. Was and then I, I, was just a, I was just a baby in diapers. And what happened was I wet on myself. So then I went out there. Yeah, well, no. Then I went out there, and here's where it comes, faith towards God. Then I called the guy back after being convicted of the Holy Ghost. That's what we need the Holy Ghost for, conviction. I went out there, and I called the guy, and I said, you know, I'm sorry for acting the way that I did, but you're not going to run over me like that. But I am sorry what? for the language and how I, I went about it. So, But did no. you call away? Before before you went and you talked to the man no, and you made things right, I Did sinned, then I repented. The Bible says if a just man falls, he gets back up seven yeah. times. I sinned, so then, then I repented. Now, I could have been away right it, then and there, Justin. So then I what does it mean to fall away? Refusal to repent. Refusal to acknowledge your sin. But refusal you to repent. A step correction. Well, refusal. here's the thing. Here's the thing, Mark. If Let me ask you this. If someone was to fall away... And they repented. Could they re be renewed again? Absolutely. Okay, that's a contradiction. Mark, that is a contradiction in your view then of Hebrews 6.6, 6, which says of those that have fallen away that it is impossible to renew them again to repentance. That's what it says. It's what the text says. It's impossible to renew them again to repentance. Hebrews 6.6. 6. So once they were arguing. Justin, it says once they, once they was at enlightened, Justin, you got to go from mighty to least. And tasted the heavenly gift, you got to go to the process, Justin. Let me go back here to Hebrews chapter 6, Justin. Yes. Okay, now Justin also read. You need to read the rest of that verse. Sin they crucified themselves, son of uh, a son of Christ afresh, and putting them open the same. That's what it means. Refusal to repent, Justin. You got to read the rest of the verse before you quote one verse. It says once enlightened, and then they continue to put Christ to open chain. That guy didn't put Christ to open chain. He said, "Okay, I repent. I'm going to quit doing that." God forgive me. He acknowledges his ways. So no, that's wrong. That's wrong. That you're reading that verse wrong. Just well, read the rest of the Bible before you quote one verse. It doesn't. It doesn't affect um, the. Well, the just not, let me just read the verse. You said you were, the way that was I, saying, if they shall fall away to renew them again to re repentance, and here's the right. stipulation of that: seeing they crucify themselves, the Son of God afresh, and put Him to open shame. See, they, right. you know, that you can have one without the other. They got to trash God and, 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 and not want to repent. I'm saying well, if you repent, if, if you sin, yes, you can repent, but you don't put Christ to open shame. Right. So no, that lines up exactly with what I'm saying. You can repent. Except, except, Mark, it says it is impossible to renew them again to repentance. Yeah, if they put him to open shame. Yeah. See, see, see what's going on in the comment section here. Like Andrew Woods, he he says here, you're telling me when I was a teenager and didn't give a crap about anything that I can't be saved again. Andrew, that's what Mark, his interpretation leads to. I'm saying uh, yes, he can. What? Justin Holman, don't miss God. I'm saying yes, he can too. If you come to save knowledge of truth, okay. save knowledge of God. Mark. Let me ask you this. Are you saying that this verse, Hebrews 6, 4, 5, and 6, teaches that a genuine born-again Christian can fall away from salvation? If they put them to open shame, like the Bible says. If they okay. trash God, yes, they can. Okay, so that's what you're, so you're talking about somebody like Andrew Woods, who says when he was a teenager, he didn't give a crap about anything, and, and he can't be saved again. Okay. No, if, if so, Andrew Wood willing to come to the and repent and come to the throne of winning grace, he can he can become a Christian and he can repent. No, not according to your interpretation, because he put God to an open now shame. Been words in my mouth, <laughs> no, well, you put words in my mouth. Okay, I'm saying you well, can repent and you can fall away. You have a choice. 
Yeah. All right. Well, let me let me let me speak to Andrew, and uh, then I'm going to have to go, Mark. <laughs> All right, go ahead, wrap it up, Justin. This is really—I'm not going to rebuttal. This is the last time. All right, here's here's the thing, Andrew. I would say this: that um, a person who is a genuine born again Christian does not renounce the Lord Jesus. It's impossible for that to happen. If it was possible, it would be impossible to renew them again to repentance. Okay, this is a warning passage to Jews who were underneath the temptation to turn away. And it serves as a type of backstop, if you will, that God uses in his sovereign salvation of his people. Okay, it's called the doctrine of perseverance uh, or preservation. All right, and so once a person is truly born again, meaning that they don't merely have a sentia up here in the mind, they're not merely acknowledging a set of facts about Jesus, but that by God's grace, he opens their mind, their heart, and their will, such that he gives them the gift of faith, and they repent of their sin, put their trust in Jesus Christ, that that person at that point in time is justified. They are then indwelt by the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit within them begins to work in them such that their life begins to be cleaned up and they begin to live their life not for sin and all the things they're in bondage to before salvation, but now they begin to live for God in obedience to him. So there may have been a period of time in your life whenever you were a teenager where you may have made, may have made a profession of faith. I, I don't know your situation, and, and I know Andrew personally a little bit. I don't know your full situation there. But it's possible, Andrew, that before you may not have um, truly have been saved. Maybe you were told by a preacher, if you pray this prayer after me or something like that, then you're going to be saved. And that is not scripturally how we are saved. We are saved by genuine repentance, genuine faith. It's a gift from God by his grace. When we put our trust in Jesus, we're born again. Uh, we must be born again. That's what Jesus said. And so later on in life, I'm not sure where you're at at this point, but it's very truly, it's very possible that as you get older, uh, that God may have dealt with you, convicted your heart of your sin, and you may have genuinely at that point been saved. I don't know your situation, so maybe we could talk about that sometime if you like. But there's examples of things like that that I see all the time. And uh, so the position that I'm arguing, go to...